Okay, let's uh, begin class here. So uh, assignment number three now uh, that is available on the course website, and it's due on October 12th at noon. We will discuss that at 1.20 today. Uh, and then also, I guess, the main part of the day, we will spend um, doing an introduction to LaTeX. Notice I pronounce it as LaTeX, not LaTeX. Uh, it is actually pronounced LaTeX. Uh, I remember I did a tweet a few years ago that, that had something about uh, LaTeX in it. And then afterwards, it's like, you know, all those people who, who uh, subscribe to me or whatever via Twitter, um, they'll, have, they'll think I'm talking about, like, the rubber, not um, LaTeX. And so I had to... Um, quickly explain what LaTeX is <laughs> in another tweet. Anyway, and the weird thing is I never even thought of, thought of pronouncing it in a different way or, uh, or, or th thought of it in a different way than as in uh, LaTeX. Um, anyway, uh, in the uh, day number one quiz, four of 11 of you indicated that you have some experience with LaTeX, so that's good. Uh, that means seven of you do not. Um, and I don't think any of you had experience with uh, something called LIX that we're going to talk about after we talk about LITEC. And basically what LIX is, L-Y-X, will provide a nice way to use LITEC that um, for those of you who already have some background in LITEC, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't also get to learn about LIX because it really makes it a lot easier. Um, Overall, talking about LaTeX and LIX is not necessarily a normal topic that's talked about in statistics courses. I've seen it done at two other universities, uh, North Carolina State University. They have a preparation for statistics research course uh, that's offered to their PhD students, and they talk about how to use LaTeX in that course. Uh, also, University of Iowa, uh, they have a course somewhat similar to this, and they talk about how to use LaTeX in that course as well. Uh, but in the majority of departments of statistics, you don't learn about that in a course situation. Typically, professors think, ah, students can pick it up themselves. That's true. They can. But if you're, especially if you're a PhD student, if you're essentially expecting them to know it, why aren't you teaching it? And so that's my philosophy about it. Uh, others, especially and even in our department, disagree. Uh, but that, that's my thinking about it. Um, and also, um, you know, I know I've taught this stuff to myself, and I, I, I have a feeling um, that if someone would have taught, taught it to me, I would have learned it a lot faster. I would have learned it a lot better originally than having to do it myself. And so I think it's actually more efficient to have something like this uh, available to students. So you can come up with your own opinions about it after we do it. Um, anyway, so let me, are there any questions before we get going here? Okay. So let's first talk about Word as in part of the Office suite of software that Microsoft uh, provides. I really like Word. I really like it um, to do my word processing. Um, I did my 300 plus page dissertation using Word. At the time, my friends who were also students and even my advisor said, you know, you should probably not use Word, but use LaTeX. Because LaTeX will allow you to do some stuff better in terms of being able to get a, a word processing-like document to look nice. So I spent a lot of time in trying to prove them wrong <laughs> and really learning word. I feel as I have, a, uh, at least among statisticians, I have a very, very, very good understanding of how to use word. And I have purposely, or I had purposely tried to stay away from the tech for most of my career. Then in 2010, I started writing a book. And the publisher said, well, you can use Word, and then basically we're going to take all the stuff that you do in Word and retype it in LaTeX or some, some other Adobe-like pack, uh, software package that they use. 
Or you can just use LaTeX itself to type up your book. Um, I didn't really want to use LaTeX. Uh, and fortunately at that time, then, I, I you know, do, did a bunch of Google searches saying, there has to be something better than using LaTeX straight. And I came across this thing called Lix, which provides a word-like interface to using LaTeX. Maybe I should have mentioned before, LaTeX is like programming in a language, almost like HTML. And so it's weird to have to actually come up with like a, a regular old like word processing document. In order to produce it, you have to actually write code to do it. And that's what LaTeX does. Lix writes the code for you. But still, you have to have some basic understanding of the code that Lix is writing to do more sophisticated things at times, or to understand why maybe Lex is giving you an error. So, like I said, I'm kind of going out of order here. I really, really like Word. And I have basically used it for everything prior to writing my book starting in 2010. And it wasn't until, you know, 2012 that I actually started writing papers in it. And this semester is the first semester that I've actually started writing my lecture notes in uh, essentially LaTeX, but actually in, in Lix. Well, I like Word, but what are some issues with it with respect to how we use it in statistics? First of all, Word's equation editor is not sufficient. Uh, it can, you can do a lot of good things with it. And, and this equation editor, I think, came out with Word 2007. The previous one before that was not sufficient either. And, and uh, Microsoft did do a good job in, in coming up with a brand new equation editor in Word 2007, but still, it is not sufficient for everything that we need to do in statistics. What you could use is math type to do your equations in Word. Anybody used math type before? Okay, one. And if you come out of this course thinking, <laughs> I don't care what Chris says, I'm not going to use LaTeX. Uh, at the very least, use math type to do equations in Word. It is so much better. So math type is basically an add-on to Word. For students, it costs like $50. Um, and, this is, and so what happens is after you install math type, you get math type right here. I want to insert equation. I just go like this. And let me make this a little bigger. And I have this nice little equation window come up. So for example, if I want to do Greek letter alpha, I just click on it. Um, if I want to do a fraction, I can just click on the corresponding um, template. And that's uh, kind of the way that Word is now with respect to its equation editor. And I can just exit it, and there you go. Notice that it's highlighted there. The only reason why it's highlighted is because I, I tell Word to highlight all my equations because it helps me find them in the document. And so some, something simple like this, you could use, obviously, Word's regular equation editor. But once you get into more complex equations that we often will have, you often cannot get Word's equation editor to work quite right. So, let me go back here. Floating tables and figures in Word. This is something that, oh, don't do this to me. So I can go like this, and look what happens. It disappears, and I'm not doing anything. Just reopen it. Just check. Good. That is recording. Okay, floating tables and figures. What do I mean by that? Well, there are ways in Word and in other kind of word processing uh, software where you can tell uh, the software to say, okay, I want my, my table or my figure to appear approximately right here in the midst of my, my text. You can do that in Word, but oftentimes it doesn't do it well in terms of, well, let's say have your, doc, your, your figure up here, and then nothing below it. And so the remaining page is blank. Um, 
and I don't think it's a, uh, my my problems with it. I don't think are necessary because I don't understand how to do it. I do understand how to do it. It's just I don't think Word gets it quite right very often. Um, now, there's a there's a nice font that comes with LaTeX. It's called Computer Modern. And it's made specifically to type out mathematical symbols and, and regular text along with it. And um, Word itself doesn't have a nice font for that purpose. Uh, but you can use math types Euclid font to essentially emulate it. And it does a pretty good job. Except for if you do look closely uh, for a, let's say, like the Greek letter alpha. If you type alpha in your normal text using Euclid, and you type alpha in the math type equation editor, there will be small differences between the two, which is disappointing. Inline equations. Well, what do I mean by that? So, oh, so this is one of the last papers that I typed in Word. So an inline equation, for example, this is an inline equation. This is a paper I did with uh, one of my PhD students. And it's inline because it's just it's continuing along in the text. And notice how everything's nicely right justified there. Uh, but you can start seeing some, some, small, some bigger spaces here to deal with that right justification. Well, the problem is, is that Word cannot s split an equation, a math type equation, um, uh, over this equal sign. So ideally, it would be nice to have CS equal on this right side here. And that will limit a lot of this extra space in there. This isn't the best example, but I've seen cases where, you know, you might have a big space here, a big space there, and so on, because it can't split the equation up, where LaTeX can't. It knows how to handle those kinds of situations. Um, also, Word cannot hyphenate stuff on its own um, in terms of, you know, let's say if you get to the, uh, the end of a line here, and for some reason I wanted to do test dash and then ed to hyphenate it uh, because it's going to make the text look nice. Word can't do that itself, but tech can. It will automatically do hyphenation for you. And this one right here was, is what made me stop using Word. Equation sizing. So the equation editor in Word's not good enough. So when you use math type, that works nicely. But the size of equations can get distorted over time the more that you save a document. So for example, if I, this is a, a nice well, a big equation that I have. If I right click on it, format object, size. And notice it says 101% is the height, 100% is the width. That wasn't a good example. Let's do this one. Notice it should be 100%, 100%. That's the key. 103%, 100%. And what I've noticed is that the more you save it, the more those, th those numbers get distorted to a point where now your, your document doesn't even look professional because sometimes when you use, let's say, a capital T here, that's going to be a different size when you're using a capital T later in, in another portion of your document. Um, and I would never submit a paper to like a journal uh, like that because it just looks very unprofessional. Um, and so <laughs> what my PhD student and I have had to do when we were, when we were writing this particular paper was that um, any time that we would resubmit the paper, because uh, often you have to submit a paper, then the referees would say, hey, I want some revisions. Then you have to resubmit it. And then they want some more revisions. Then you do the revisions and you resubmit. Every single time we do that, we have to actually go through every single equation in our paper. So look at where all the highlighting is. Look through every single equation in the paper to, to see if the sizing is correct. If it's not correct, it has to be changed. That is a big pain, and that's what was the last straw for me. Um, I'll just talk about this one, last one next. So in PowerPoint, I know we're talking about Word here, but we'll talk about Word, uh, PowerPoint here. 
So one of the things I really liked with, I think it was starting with PowerPoint 2013, was that they actually put into PowerPoint 2013 the new equation editor that was in Word 2010. Um, and the nice thing about that is because it allowed you to do inline equations in PowerPoint, where before what you had to do with PowerPoint was that you create an equation and then you had to move the, actually physically move the equation with your mouse because it was treated as an image to a particular place in your text so that it emulated the inline equation. And so, you know, that this was some of my first experiences with the new equation editor then, in terms of I you know, really tried to get it to work, and I just couldn't get it to work for the complex equations that I needed. So instead, what you can do is you can use math type, but again, you're basically creating an image, and that image has to be moved in the text to emulate as if it was inline an inline equation. Uh, that's uh, disappointing. Uh, with LaTeX, you don't have to worry about that. So, anyway, so, so those are some of the issues that I have with, with using Word. I still use Word a lot, uh, but I think at least for professional writing, such as writing a paper, let's say, which many of you will at some point in your career, um, or you, know, you can even do this with, you know, let's say, writing up your, your homework in various classes. Using LaTeX will make it look a lot better. Okay, so... Any questions before we move on? Um, so what is LaTeX? Well, first we need to talk about what is tech. So tech is a is a basically like a computer language that was first developed in the 1970s that was meant for the mathematical sciences uh, to help you know get mathematical symbols to work uh, well in, in documents. Um, people don't use tech. Instead, what they do is they use well. Kind of, they use LaTeX, uh, which basically was tech with some add-ons to make it a lot easier for people to use. So this LaTeX is free, so that's nice. Um, for in this in statistics, uh, especially if you're going for a PhD, uh, most professors will use this, like for writing their dissertation. Uh, most professors will use this for submitting papers to journals. Um, but it's not just statistics, it's in math, it's in computer science, and it's in many other disciplines as well. Um, now, with LaTeX, you lose some control over how you can structure the document in terms of like choosing fonts and, and some other stuff. And while there are ways to change fonts, but typically um, people rely on particular, you could say, styles, using a word terminology, rely on certain styles that are available to you and just go with that rather than you controlling it. Also, if you wanted to put something in a, let's say, a specific place in your document, like for some reason the upper right-hand corner of the document, well, in Word, you know, you can move something up there really easy. In LaTeX, you can't as easy do that. So you give up some control over exactly what the document looks like. Um, kind of kind of address talking about journals um, and books. Um, so often if you, and I, I went through this a lot in my career, if you let's say I have a paper accepted by a particular journal and they'll say okay well why don't you give us our, our, your original source document that you used to type it, such as Word or LaTeX. If I give it to them in Word they have to basically retype it. And what happens when somebody retypes something that you do? Well, there's going to be more likely errors. And especially in very technical writing, you want to avoid those kinds of errors. And so, you know, at some point, uh, you know, an author will be given an opportunity to look at a, what's called a proof of the paper before it's actually formally published. And you can look through it and correct those errors, but still, you might not catch everything. Where with LaTeX, if you type in a LaTeX, there's going to be a lot less errors because they're not going to retype it. They'll just directly incorporate it into their, uh, their journal style, and it will be just uh, typically fine. They're very, they're very, uh, it's very unlikely to have errors um, other than when they have to rearrange stuff like in terms of tables. 
Um, and as I said, LaTeX is basically a programming language. And it's very somewhat similar to, to typing stuff in HTML. So it's uh, like a markup language. Um, and in order, and, 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 and so you, you basically you write a computer program. Then what you need to do is transfer this computer program to a more readable format that anybody can read. And so that's where you do what's called compiling. So if you have experience with a programming language like C, C and Fortran, you have to compile a particular program to an executable that can be actually used. Here in LaTeX, you compile your code to a PDF document. And you can distribute that PDF document to others to view or to print itself. So you always have to compile it. And as you might expect, since this is a, you're basically writing computer code, there can be errors. And so you're going to have to figure out where those errors are. Um, and those errors will pop up during the compile, compilation process. Well, after all that, I do want to say I do not like LaTeX. Uh, I really don't think, and I kind of said this before, I really don't think one should have to write a computer program to write a, a document like a paper or other report to distribute to others. And so the only reason why, I guess in the end, the reason why I actually have made that switch to using LaTeX is because of Lix. And as I kind of said, Lix is going to give you a word-like graphical user interface to using LaTeX. And so you will not have to deal with most of the LaTeX code yourself. But we will talk about, for the next day or maybe two, talk about the LaTeX code here so that you can understand what, what Lix is doing. And because of those particular situations where Lix doesn't quite give you what you need through point and click measures or other ways, and you have to actually insert code in your document. So just to give you an example of what a Lix document will look like, obviously we'll spend a lot more time on this later, here's my lecture notes here today. And you can see it looks pretty much like what you see in, the, in, the, in well, my paper copy. Um, and it looks kind of like Word in terms of how you interact with it. You don't see computer code, really, at all. Now, there was a few places where I, I did need to do some computer code. So you see this little red box? There's LaTeX code right there. And what's overall all this LaTeX code that's, that will be actually... Well, let me back up a second. So when I click on this little, um, little thing right here, this is what's going to compile my code, um, my, my document, that is. And it's going to send it to LaTeX. It's going to create the LaTeX code. And then that LaTeX code is going to be made into a, a PDF file. And to show you what the LaTeX code looks like, I can take a look at it in the source pane. Let's do all. And this is the actual code. So if you really wanted to, you could learn how to do all this code, or you just simply, you know, learn how to use it in lists like this. Okay. Now before we can actually take a look at a LaTeX document, I know this is a, quite a long introduction. People don't actually use LaTeX. <laughs> Uh, in terms of uh, rather <coughs> they don't use it directly. For Windows users, they use something called MicTech, typically. There's other versions of LaTeX out there, you could say, but most people use MicTech if they're using a Windows computer. Uh, if you're using a Mac, there's other versions of of LaTeX that are available out there. I don't use a Mac, so I, I don't know what they are off the top of my head. Uh, but do a simple search and you'll come across some. And so, so, so what we will focus more on is MCTEC or MCTEC. Um, now, I will still call it LaTeX. Everyone that I know will call it still LaTeX, but it is actually MCTEC. Okay, that's just w w the way it is. MCTEC is free. 
You can download it from that particular website there. Instead of doing that, what I would recommend, because eventually you'll have to use all this, go to the Lix website. Let me show you. By the way, Lix is free. So this is a Lix website. If I come here to download, you see two different, this I'm just going to talk about with respect to Windows. Uh, you see two different versions you can download. A bundle or installer. If you don't already have LaTeX on your computer or MicTech, do the bundle because that will also install MicTech at the same time. And I recommend that you do it that way versus downloading MicTech from MicTech's website. It just will save you some time. If you already have something that will do LaTeX on your computer already, do the installer. Hold on, I might be wrong there. Hmm. At least what, what I've done in the past, I don't know, maybe they changed their wording here, because this should, this sh basically this is just Lix itself, and this is Lix with Mitech, uh, MicTech. Um, even though it says if you already have an older version of Lix, this should still work. Just download if you already have like MicTech on your computer. If you want to be absolutely safe, I'll do this version. Sorry about that. Hmm. Okay. Okay, with LaTeX, and again, I'm just going to call it LaTeX, and, and note that you know, this, this weird set of letters there, I'm not doing that. If you just type LaTeX in an actual document, it automatically will do that weird symbol set of letters there uh, itself. So I'm not purposely trying to do that. Um, well, with, with LaTeX, so LaTeX is free. And, and, and R, R is free as well. And uh, Python is free as, to, as well. And with these free software packages, one of the nice aspects of them is that it usually gives users a way to, let's say, um, make the, pack, the software package better. So you can have user-contributed extensions to R, Python, uh, LaTeX. And all these free software packages then will have a particular a library, you could say, on the web where you can actually obtain them. So for R, it's called CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network. And there are over 6,000 packages, so 6,000 extensions to R that are freely available out there. With LaTeX, there is the CTAN, the Comprehensive Tech Archive Network. And there are numbers of packages that are available out there for you to use we will see some examples of actually obtaining them. Um, and in the end, you can have LaTeX automatically install them on the fly. So you say, hey, I want to use this package, and we'll go get it. And so you don't really have to worry about it. You don't even have to go to the web, web, website. But at least I think it's important to know that the website exists. So with LaTeX itself, you again will be writing a computer program. So you need to have a program editor to type your program in. With MicTech, there is a particular program editor called TechWorks. I recommend not using it. I mean, it works fine, but there are better program editors out there. My favorite that I use is called WinEdit, but unfortunately, WinEdit's not free. Um, you're welcome to use it. I like it because I think the syntax highlighting in it is the best of all the editors. But since it's not free, I'm not going to focus on it in class. Or I will not focus on it in class. Instead, I will focus on this one. This is the one I see most students um, will end up using when I do teach LaTeX. It's called TechMaker. 
It's free. Um, and this is what it looks like. Let's see. Let me see if I can get this a little bigger. I forgot to do that before class. There we go. So this is what TechMaker looks like. And what I have loaded in TechMaker right now is our first tech document that we're going to look at. It's called first.tech, for lack of a better name. And uh, I just want to point out some things to it. Uh, 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 th some things about it. And uh, for example, on the left hand side, we have an outline of our document. In the, the main part here, this is the actual tech code. Down below, after we compile the document, we'll have some information printed here, kind of like the SAS log window. And then also after we can, we'll compile it, as long as I have it set up right. we'll have our PDF document appear. Of course, it's not going to appear right now for some reason. But trust me, it will appear when you try it on your own. Uh, and so you can see, you, you'll be able to see the PDF document corresponding to the actual computer code. So TechMaker is, 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 is nice. Um, and I guess you can see in the screen capture what it should be looking like. There's another one that I have less experience with that uh, I think is good. It's called Tech Studio. Again, it's free. You're welcome to take a look at it as, as you want to. Um, if you do a search for LaTeX uh, ed uh, program editors, you'll see lots of other ones out there. Um, and perhaps I went overboard and I give you a few more. One thing that I have not seen though, which I, I wish would happen, is that there will be a, a, a t uh, an editor out there. Oh, let me let me actually go back to you here. There will be an editor out there, so that let's say I made a change to some code here, and then immediately I would see an update over there, without having to physically compile it myself and say, you know, go ahead and make the PDF. I have not seen an editor like that. Or what would be nice too is if you come over here, make a edit, and then the code changes too. You see this, for example, with HTML editors out there. Like, for example, if you're familiar with Dreamweaver, you can do that kind of stuff where you're looking at a web page in one window, the HTML code in another window, and they both will update depending upon if you update here, this one will update. If you update this one, this will update. I have not seen that with LaTeX. Okay, finally we get to our first document. I've titled this Hello World because often whenever you're typing a, your very first program, program in a new programming language, you often will say Hello World as the very first thing that you uh, have, let's say, printed to your screen from, from running the program. And so the actual PDF that is generated. Oh. Oh, oops, wrong class. It was a very simple document, just meant to show you some aspects. So you see a title, you see the author, you see the date. There are five sections to this document. Um, and basically these are the five sections that you very often find in, in, in statistical research papers. An introduction, background information, a proposed new methodology that you're doing, a simulation study that you're using to prove that indeed what you're doing works, and then an overall discussion about it. And in this PDF, I just am 
purposely just showing you some, at, some things, um, such as writing equations, such as doing a misspelling there, um, such as uh, doing a table. Okay. So let's talk about then the actual LaTeX code that's used to generate this document. Look over here to TechMaker. So, at the top of every LaTeX file that you have, and again, notice that this is called first.tech. That's the name of the file. If you see where my mouse is, all LaTeX files have a .tech extension to it. And again, after you compile them, you produce a PDF that you can print or distribute to others. At the very top of every LaTeX file, you have the code slash document class, and then you need to tell LaTeX, what kind of document am I doing here? In the curly brackets here, you see article, meaning, let's say, maybe I'm typing a paper to submit to a journal, for example. If I had book instead, I could put book as my document class. If I have maybe just a simple report, I could have report as my document class. There's a number of different document classes out there. Articles, probably the most um, used one. And then in the, the square brackets here, you have various options that you want to use with this document class. In this case, I want a 12-point font. Very simple. Now, I can then also set various options corresponding to the height and the width of my documents. Now, will I ever ask you, you know, to know exactly what that code is? No. But again, we're looking at the code here so we have better understanding what Lix does in the end. So, how do you set the, the height and the width of the text? There you go, set length. To do comments, begin a line with a percent, percent sign. So, percent margins and spacings. I put the comment in there so that you understand well, what this weird code is doing. Next, I have a comment for packages to use. So, CTAN, I said, contains a number of extensions to using LaTeX. The one extension that we're going to use here to just demonstrate what you could do is to use an extension called um, get this over, sorry. Actually, I'm just going to close that out. I usually leave it closed out. I'm going to use, I'm going to use an extension called HyperRef, which allows me to make basically hyperlinks with inside my document that will actually link to other parts of my document and also allow me to do some other stuff. So this is an actual package, what, what, what LaTeX will call a package, that is an extension to LaTeX. You can download it from the CTAN website. Uh, in fact, I think it actually is installed by default, so you don't have to actually do that. Um, now, if you didn't already have it, you can tell LaTeX, go download it and install it on the fly. <coughs> and the way to do that, this is uh, not the default, is if you find MCTEC on your computer. There we go. And this is displayed on page 12. Go under Settings. You have this nice little um, window pop-up. And the key one, it says, package install, if you see where my mouse is, package installation. You can choose whether missing packages are to be installed on the fly. So I have yes there. I recommend always doing that. Uh, there's one little error that sometimes can happen in Lix if you do that, uh, but uh, that's a temporary error. I'll address it at a later date if needed. Uh, so I have yes there. So if hyperref wasn't on my computer, first time I try to compile this document, LaTeX will copy it. Then I have some options here. Bookmarks open. Bookmarks number. What does that mean? How, what did it do? If I come over here to the actual PDF that was created by this document, 
Notice how I have these things over here? These are my bookmarks. So if I simply click on them, it will take me to particular parts of my PDF document. Also, what that hyperref package did, notice how I have this red box in round three. This is a hyperlink. So if I click on that, it takes me to section three. Some other stuff. The title of my document, slash title, curly bracket, hello world, exclamation mark, and curly bracket. The author of the document. Um, we'll talk about this one shortly. And then finally I get to document body. So this is where you type the main part of your text in your document. Like, what's going to go in section one? What's going to go in section two? And so on. Everything before you see slash begin document is what LaTeX calls its preamble. That is an important term to know. It's called the preamble. Because Lix will also have a preamble where you can actually enter in LaTeX code such as this to get everything as needed. So again, before you get to the main part of the document, it's called the preamble. Everything else is your body of the document. It begins with begin document. It ends with end document. Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm doing this in the right order. Note that LaTeX is case sensitive. So capital L is different from a lowercase l. Okay. Then some of this is intuitive in terms of the, the actual code. Some of it's not. So um, if I want to have a title on my document, in terms of notice how I had set hello world up here and also had the author listed. If I want that information printed, I can do slash make title. And so that's what caused, you see where my mouse is, hello world, Chris Builder reprinted, and also the date. In this particular document class, the default is to always put the date there if you ask for the title. Again, this is where you're losing control as opposed to, let's say, Word, where you would actually have to type out the date, or you could say, Word, always insert the, what the current date is when you print it. Here we lose that. Um, there's ways that you can say, don't print the date. If, um, but um, for us right now, I don't think it's really that important to go into. So then I have my sections. So section one, how do I get that? Slash section. In the curly brackets, I put the title. And then you can type like normal. So the slash section is LaTeX code. The stuff essentially after that is then you're just your normal text that you're typing. Notice when I come up to slash section one, you see this little orange part right there? Some editors in that, that do for LaTeX allow code folding. We saw code folding in, in the SAS program editor. If I just click on this uh, dash or minus sign, notice how the code is folded up. <coughs> so this can be helpful if you're looking through a document and you have a whole bunch of text being typed there. Obviously for this purpose it's not that important. Then section two. Um, slash section, background. That was the name of it. I have a subsection, section 2.1, slash subsection, notation. Again, what does that correspond to? Let's look at the LaTeX doc, I'm sorry, let's look at the PDF. You can see the background, you can see the notation. Something I failed to mention, notice that so is misspelled. Well, tech, or I should say tech maker, picks that up and underlines it with a red font. Um, 
it doesn't do no grammar checks in like Word. So you need to make sure your grammar is correct. I've never seen any kind of um, editor for LaTeX uh, program editor that will pick up grammar checks. It will pick up spelling checks or misspell misspellings. Okay. So here's my next section, section four, and then section five. LaTeX handles all the numbering for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Let's talk about doing some mathematical symbols. Okay. So in my PDF, you see where my mouse is, you see y sub i. So that's the first time that I use any kind of mathematical symbol in my documents. Notice how it's nicely italicized. That is the standard to italicize this kind of stuff in formal statistical mathematical writing. To get LaTeX to correctly represent it, to tell, say, hey, this is going to be some kind of mathematical equation. If it's an inline equation, notice how I have sent or I have suppose y sub i4, it's within right inside that line. I can enclose my y and i by dollar signs. That's just the syntax that LaTeX uses for an inline equation. How did I do the subscript? An underscore means we have some subscript stuff. So y underscore i, y subscript i. If I wanted to, let's say, raise y to the second power, I would say y caret sign 2. Um, there's a wide variety of different mathematical things that you can do in these equations in terms of what the symbol means. Like if you want a Greek letter, if I were to type slash alpha, I get the Greek letter alpha. If I do slash alpha again, but with an uppercase A for the for the alpha for the first letter of alpha, I get the uppercase alpha. Notice slash L dots. That's a way to do the dot, dot, dot that we see right here for i equal 1 to n. So there's lots and lots of different um, symbols, um, uh, functions, you could say, uh, to get this stuff. And, you know, we can't talk about them all. Very often they're intuitive, like slash alpha. You always have to begin with a slash, though whenever you do like a, a, a LaTeX function or a uh, LaTeX symbol like that. Um, now, also here's a nice little example. Here's sigma squared, slash sigma caret sign 2. To do the mean or to do mu, slash mu. But let's say that you had a bigger equation. Oops. Let's say you had a bigger equation such as the whole uh, normal density. Well, in those cases, you want that equation offset, or what, what LaTeX will call a display equation. So it's offset from the rest of the text. It's on a line of its own. And to do that in LaTeX, use a double uh, dollar sign at the beginning and at the end. Now all of this gets into what, what LaTeX calls environments. So what we do here with this y sub i, we're telling LaTeX within those two dollar signs, treat this as a mathematical environment. With the double dollar signs, treat this as a display mathematical environment. Everything inside there. And so LaTeX is based upon these environments. In fact, 
when I say slash section, that's an environment as well. And in general, code corresponding to an environment can be written like this. So instead of using the single dollar sign, I could say slash begin curly bracket math and curly bracket. And then instead of ending with a dollar sign, do slash end math. And I get exactly the same thing. This is just a more formal way to do it. So the dollar signs essentially uh, act as a shortcut, since you're very often wanting to do that kind of stuff. Um, so let's see now. So here's that display equation. Notice I do slash begin display math. I get exactly the same thing in my document. That's why you see the, the, code, the, the same text repeated. Are there any questions? Okay, so we still got some more stuff to go through with respect to uh, uh, this document. We'll finish that part up next time. I will show you then how we can compile our document so we can actually produce a nice PDF file. Um, let's next now talk about uh, the last assignment for the SAS portion of our course. It's a similar format as before. You can work in pairs again. Uh, it is shorter this time. Yes? I just have a quick question. Sure. Like, uh, we, do we have like anywhere that we can like, like in SAS we have like tells us for like polls. So do we have anything that we have like um, I do give some information about where to find help later in the, in the document itself. But there isn't um, a formal like LaTeX help that's built into the editors. Um, very often, at least what I have uh, found to be the most useful is Google. <laughs> um, there's sometimes, I think I see these in, in, in the editors. There's help. Yeah, there, there is like a, a little reference manual to help you out. So that might be helpful as well. But again, we're not going to have to get into the code too much. And so that's, I guess, one reason I'm not emphasizing the help aspect. But that, that was a good question. Are there other questions? Okay. So, again, this is a, a shorter assignment. It's primarily focused on macros, but it does build on some, some of the stuff prior to macros. I didn't put PROC IML stuff in this since we didn't really talk about it very much. However, in problem number two, there are ways to solve that using PROC IML. You're welcome to explore those on your own if you're interested. So let's talk about uh, problem number one. Um, continuing the same theme that we've been doing, we're going to go back to problem number one of assignment number two. So that's with that NFL combine data. And the purpose of this problem is to now allow you to explore how you could use macros to simplify some of your code, code that you used previously, to generalize it to a way that uh, is not just, let's say, one scatter plot that you were doing before, but you could do it for multiple scatter plots and have, let's say, that, that uh, player um, that maybe has the largest uh, bench press automatically indicated on one of your plots. So part E from assignment number two, or 1E, involved constructing a scatter plot of a 40-yard dash versus bench press. Hopefully you remember that. Uh, this plot included the largest bench press value being labeled by the corresponding player's name. Now, how did you all do that? Well, typically, uh, you know, you looked at, maybe you did the plot without labeling first, and you said, oh yeah, I see that person, that person has a bench press with a number of reps greater than 40. So I'm going to create some kind of if-then statement, maybe in a data step, so I can tell, so I can, so SAS can recognize, hey, this is a special person, and then in my PROC SG plot code, then I said, do a label based upon this special person. Generally speaking, that's how you did it. Not everyone did it exactly the same way, 
make sure you see how I did it myself. And what I did was I actually used product means to automatically tell me what that largest bench press value was rather than just simply looking at the pot myself. I had proc means tell me what the largest was. And then, once I had that, I actually manually inserted into a data step with an if-then-else to help me label that particular player. But you can make this a lot better or a lot more automated through the use of macros. So now imagine you use proc means, you find what that largest value was, and then you use, and then you create a macro variable that has that value, that numerical value in it. So that then when you use that if-then-else statement, you can refer to that macro variable and have that person label. Essentially, that's what I want you to do. So I want you to automate the process so that you don't have to run the code, let's say, twice to figure out where that one value is. And so that, you know, you could generalize this to basically any variable. Let's say you, you wanted to um, do it for another variable, uh, not bench press, but some other variable, you want to find that max value. Essentially, you could run that, you could basically take that same code with this new variable and run it again and have that person label on the plot. I'm not having you do that, but um, for the plot that you were doing for 40 yard dash versus bench press, I want you to generalize it so that, again, you don't have to manually put in 42 or 40 or whatever. The macro variable does it for you. It's automatically generated. Then part B. This is separate from A. Construct a macro function that produces a scatter plot like in part E again, but now for any two numerical variables in the data set. So that I want to see a call to the macro function, such, such as this, my plot, parentheses, what's going to go on the x-axis, comma, what goes on the y-axis, and parentheses. So that for any two variables, you get a scatter plot. I want to see a macro function that does that. Make sure you have appropriate titles and axis labels, because obviously if you're doing different um, um, variables, you can't use 40-yard uh, dash versus bench press. I've seen students do that. That's why I bring that up. <laughs> and then run the, run the macro on dash 40 versus bench press but also for height versus weight. There should not be anything in that function that you have to change when you go from run it from the first scatter plot to the second scatter plot. The only thing that will change is what you put in there for those variables. Are there any questions? Problem number two. So this is continuation of problem number two on assignment number two. So we're dealing with that shelf life again. Excuse me. So, again, the shelf life is the time point where the 95% confidence interval lower band for the expected value of y intersects a horizontal line drawn at 95% potency level. In a more mathematical context, what this means is here's that lower bound subtract off 0.95 for that potency level set that equal to zero, solve for x, in other words, time, and then you'll get the actual numerical value. So far, all we've done is approximated by what we see on the plot. But this will give you the actual numerical value. I want you to write some, a SAS program that will automatically calculate this shelf life up to uh, one decimal place of precision. So maybe it might be like 50.1 or 52.5, something like that. There are a number of ways that you can get this done. I put two in my uh, answer key. 
both of them, uh, well, did both of them do that? Hold on. Yes. Both of them, and this one isn't, a, isn't fancy. I'm not expecting something fancy here. Uh, both of them did a simple grid search. What do I mean? What do you think I mean by a, a grid search? So I use a grid search to find basically the solution to this expression there when I solve for x. All I did was I evaluated this quantity on the left-hand side of the equal sign. I evaluated, for example, at maybe x equal 49, 49.1. 49.2. I kept on doing that up until maybe like 55. And I looked to see which of the corresponding quantities was closest to zero. That's a simple grid search. There are obviously more sophisticated optimization methods out there. You, know, you could use, I wouldn't call this sophisticated, bisection. You've taken a numerical methods course. But there's other ones too. I chose not to worry about those other methods, and I just did a simple grid search. So that's how I recommend doing it, but you could use more sophisticated methods if needed, if desired, I should say. One of these grid searches that I did relied on creating macro variables. That's why I decided to put this in this part. Okay, so that's assignment number three. Now, this assignment's due after the midterm. So do you need to get it be done before the midterm? No. But could, would it be helpful to at least attempt it before the midterm? Yes. Okay. You know, it's always difficult, you know, trying to line up, you know, assignments with, um, you know, the exact uh, date of a, of a test. And, you know, just from looking at the schedule, you know, I could say, okay, why don't you get it done by, oh, uh, maybe uh, October 3rd. Well, that's next Monday. That will give me enough time to grade it and then enough time for us to discuss it in the October 4th class. But I didn't think you probably would be happy with me if you, if you only had basically six days to complete this because, of course, you have other stuff to do, other, other courses and stuff. So, so that's why I decided to make it due after the exam. Okay, any questions? Okay, then that's it for today.